Hey there students and welcome back as I continue my lecture on religious freedom in colonial New England and focusing specifically at this point on the religious dissenters in New England, Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson. If you didn't see part one of this video, might want to look at that. But then again, if you're just curious about Roger Williams, you've come to the right place. Roger Williams was a separatist minister in the Massachusetts colony. Now, by separatist, it's important that you know what that means because there are two terms that are generally used to refer to the settlers of Massachusetts. Those terms are Puritans and separatists. Now, Puritans were people who were part of a movement to purify the Church of England, to take out all of those nasty, papist, Catholic elements, whereas the separatists had a movement to separate from the Church of England, that we're not reformers, we would like to start our own church. And then what did they have in common? What they had in common was a commitment to Calvinist theology and principles. And I'll discuss Calvinism a bit more in a moment, and I've also got a video on Calvinism if you're curious about the ins and outs of the theological doctrines. But for this purpose, uh, plain clothes, predestination, all of that other stuff. So being a separatist minister, Roger Williams was not a fan of the Church of England. He didn't want to reform it. He wanted to start a new church that would be along the lines of how he envisioned the primitive Christian church in the book of Acts in the New Testament. Now, Roger Williams was going to be at odds with the religious and civil leaders of the Massachusetts colony because, remember, this was not an experiment in American individualism or American religious pluralism. This was a religious commonwealth where people were expected to conform. Well, Roger Williams is a separatist minister. He felt like People shouldn't be forced to worship. Imagine that. How American does that sound? And Williams was not happy with this arrangement. Williams was an advocate of liberty of conscience. He believed that civil authorities should not be able to enforce religious orthodoxy or support a state church. And this is where we see American individualism really rearing its head. Okay, here in the Massachusetts colony, we really haven't seen this in this very communal religious commonwealth until Williams comes along. Now, Williams also believed that the English government did not have the authority to give away Indian land if it had not first purchased that land, that the Indians are the rightful inhabitants of this land, and you can't just come in and say that it's yours if you did not negotiate a treaty with the Indians. So really, this is strike two. So there are two ways that Roger Williams has come out swinging and the authorities do not like him. And they exiled him by Roger. All right, they, they exiled him and he was exiled out of Massachusetts and he went to set up a settlement at what is today Rhode Island. Now, Williams at the time called it Providence Plantations. He named this for God's providence, which he believed had brought him there. The idea of providence being that God is in control, a very Calvinist sort of construct. Of course, that's really a Christian construct that, you know, God is in control and has kind of set a path for things to turn out all right. Now, the idea of providence will be shown again in U.S. history when you look at the Declaration of Independence in the very last sentence Jefferson writes, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And Jefferson here is projecting this idea that providence is on our side, that God loves loves America. All right, America. Woo! All right. Doesn't that get you all patriotic and warm and fuzzy inside? And the other thing that Williams does, consistent with his principles, is what I would call, speaking of Jefferson, the Providence Purchase. Because Williams goes to the local Indians and says, hey, I want to create a settlement here. Can I? And he negotiates a treaty. And they sell him the land. So this is consistent with William's principles that English men and women did not have the authority to just come in and claim land that, in William's eyes, belonged to someone else. 
And one thing that's very odd about Williams, now I've mentioned before that the English did not really have a state-sponsored program of evangelism like the French and the Spanish had, but he did not baptize a single Indian which this was seen as offensive by the religious leaders at the time because that should be the goal, right? To convert these pagans to Christianity. But that's not how Williams saw things. That Williams believed that, first of all, somebody should have freedom of conscience. He lived among these Indians but never baptized any because he didn't think that any of them had made a sincere conversion, that it's really a burden on the minister not to, oh, you want to be baptized? Great. Uh, come in the church and give us your money. But that a minister should really think about, is this person sincere? Do I feel comfortable baptizing this person? Williams was a man of unquestionable principle. And he went on to found the first Baptist church in America in 1638. A lot of towns in America have First Baptist churches, but Williams founded the very first one, and it's still there today. And it looks like the pastor is kind of a clever person who ever runs the board. I'd love to hear that sermon. What would Scooby-Doo? You know, that sort of thing, all right? But First Baptist Church America. And I think this is a very significant development in American history because when it comes down to it, the Baptist faith has been a hallmark in American religion, all right? It's the second largest religious group in the United States, second only to Roman Catholics. It's the largest Protestant denomination. And 15% of Americans identify as Baptist, and one-third of Baptists live in the United States. And there is something about this religious mindset that I think is uniquely American, all right, because it, it is not prevalent anywhere else in the Western world like it is in the United States. You think about a third of Baptists live in the U.S., and most of that other two-thirds, it's a product of missionary activity and that sort of thing. And so the Baptists, I think, you know, they, they've really found fertile ground here for three reasons, all right? That it is a very American religion. First of all, that individuals have the ability to interpret the Bible. There is not the expectation that your individual interpretation of Scripture must fall in line with the church, like several other religious denominations have. Uh, for example, in the Catholic Church, you have the Catechism, and it basically lays out the doctrines of the church church for you. But Baptists believe that your views of God and the Bible and theology, that's really up to you, first and foremost. Autonomous congregations that are governed democratically. So in a Baptist church, the pastor is not sent by the bishop or another church authority. The congregation hires, and if they want to, fires the minister, and they have full control over what happens in their congregation. And then finally, a believer's baptism, that Baptists reject infant baptism. They believe that baptism should be a product of someone's personal decision, not a product of your parents deciding for you that you are going to be a Christian. So I think that the, the individualism of the of the Baptist, the way that they even in groups want to control things locally and that decisions are made by the individual, I think a lot of this explains why the Baptist religion is so much more prevalent in the United States than it is in other Western countries. And here are a few quotes from Roger Williams to shed some more light on his religious views. Now, first of all, a couple hundred years almost before Jefferson used the term wall of separation in a letter, it was Roger Williams who wanted to build a wall between the church and the state. He wrote, when they have opened a gap in the hedge or wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world, God hath ever broke down the wall itself, removed the candlestick, and made his garden a wilderness as at this day. So for Roger Williams, the church is a garden and it should be protected from the state. It should not mingle with the wilderness of the world, so to speak. 
So why should there be a separation of church and state to Roger Williams? Well, the state, even a democratic state, is based on majority rule. When we have an election, the people who lose the election have to suck it up and deal with it. But the church, in Williams' view, is not based on hierarchy and it is not based on majority rule. Instead, it is based on liberty of conscience. This is a place where no one can overrule you or your judgment. And so that needs to be protected. That is sacred. Now, Williams didn't necessarily even remain a good Baptist all his life. His writings later on show a belief in what we would call restorationism, this idea that the church, as we saw it in the book of Acts in the New Testament, that that church at some point ceased to exist, all right? That that church was led astray and that church no longer exists. You know, God has just let it go into the wilderness, so to speak. And so restorationism is this idea that the church one day will be restored at a time of God's choosing and through agents of God's choosing. Williams wrote, there is no regularly constituted church of Christ on earth, nor any person qualified to administer any church ordinances, nor can there be until new apostles are sent by the great head of the church for whose coming I am seeking. So Williams believed that this early church had no longer existed, that it had ceased to exist. And this is really consistent with other religious groups that will spring up in America in the 19th century, such as the Latter-day Saints, otherwise known as Mormons, that the idea that new apostles will be necessary to clarify Christ's original meaning in creating the church. And you see that Williams is writing this a couple hundred years before Joseph Smith has his revelations in New York. In 1644, Roger Williams finally gets a charter. I discussed in another lecture how these charters worked, and if before you had a charter, you really didn't have the protection of the English government. So now, in 1644, Williams is legit, and Providence Plantations, otherwise known as Rhode Island, is an actual English colony. And these islands here say it all. One last look at Roger Williams that I think is really telling about his view of things. And it's very encouraging. I find this guy, the more I read about him, the more interested I am in Roger Williams. But he named islands. You know, Rhode Island is not an island, but there are islands around there. So let's look at these islands. The larger islands here, he named Patience and Prudence after Christian virtues. And then when we look at this other island, we see that this is Hope Island. Now, next to Hope Island is a much smaller island known as Despair Island. So to Roger Williams, despair may seem like it's goddess at the time, but hope is always greater, almost like the story of Pandora's box. And I hope you'll stick around for the next segment in which I'm going to focus specifically on Anne Hutchinson, the other religious dissenter that Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams together are responsible for the beginnings of religious pluralism and religious toleration as we know them today in America. So I hope you'll click through and continue watching with me as we continue to explore religious freedom in colonial New England. It's always a pleasure.